Let's start in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Um, so we're starting a new series, okay? And I hope, I'm excited about the series, okay? I don't know if you're excited or not, but it doesn't really matter because I'm the one who's preaching, so I'm excited about it. That's a good thing. I hope you are excited about it too. And it's called Hard Sayings of the Bible, okay? And what that means is we're going to cover one of two things. Either something hard to understand, okay? Or something hard to apply. Let me give you two examples. Okay, one is today, is when Jesus said, the Father is greater than I. How can you swallow this? Aren't they the same? Aren't they one? How can he say that the Father is greater than I? So that's a difficult thing. It's a hard thing to understand. We'll explain that. Another example of hard thing to apply. If you write I causes you to sin, lock it out and throw it away. That's, you know, that's a difficult commandment, okay? Or um, uh, leave everything, you know, sell everything, stuff like this, okay? So, and everyone we're covering, we're not just covering that one thing or one verse, we're covering other things that are related to it, so we have better understanding of the Word of God. This will help you very much as servants, because we get asked these questions a lot, so we're ready and prepared for anyone that wants uh, to question the Word of God. So today, we're covering the verse that says that Jesus said that the Father is greater than I. This verse is in John 14, 28, okay? I'm going to read the entire verse and tell you how we're going to tackle this. Jesus said, You have heard me to say I'm going away and coming back to you. If you loved me, you would rejoice because I said I'm going to the Father, for my Father is greater than I. John 14, 28. How is the Father greater than the Son? Aren't they one? Aren't they equal? Because remember, when Jesus says something, you know, he doesn't exaggerate like us, okay? And he doesn't say compliments, okay? When he says something, this is the truth, okay? So how can we explain that? When we study a verse like this, or whenever you study a verse, you have very, very well to study the context Okay, how it was said, and in one, in, in what what context, context, context it was said, the context of the entire chapter, and not only the context of the the entire chapter, even the context of the entire book. Okay, so I'm going to give you this verse in the chapter, and in the book itself, and you will find it very, 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 very easy to understand why Jesus said that the Father is greater than I. First of all, what cha- like John 14, what, did, what does it start with? It's a very famous chapter because the beginning is very nice. Huh. There are chapters يعني, easy to let not your heart be troubled. That's the beginning, John 14. Let your heart not be troubled. It's, it's, it's known. What's John 14, 15, 16? Pentecost, the paraclete, the last speech of Christ to the disciples. Thursday evening after the supper, he spoke about this. He gave a very, very, very long speech. It's the goodbye speech, the farewell of Jesus when he was calming them down and preparing them for the cross, okay? And the entire speech was about one thing. It's comfort. That's why it started with, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in the Father, believe also in me. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. If it was not so, I would have told you, and so on. So it's all about, I have to go. Don't worry. It's for your own good. It's expected. 
and it will be for your own good. If you read the three chapters, they're all about this. Remember my commandments, especially the most important commandment of love. That's what he spoke about. He spoke about the Holy Spirit, spoke about love, loving one another. And, and it was all comfort. It's better for me that I go. Okay, he's preparing all of them. Okay, so everything he said in that speech has to fall into this context. Okay, it's better for me to go. It's good for you. It's better for you. It's advantageous for you that I go. Why is it advantageous for the son to go? Because he said mainly, if I don't go, you wouldn't receive the Holy Spirit. Why? How is the relationship? The relationship is very simple. The Holy Spirit, like the purpose of the cross and the resurrection and all of this, was not the resurrection. It was not just the cross and not only the resurrection. The entire purpose came in Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came upon the church. That was the purpose of everything that's happening. Why? Because Jesus with them, he's going to be with them for, for a short period of time. And even with, when Jesus was with the disciples, he would teach them and they wouldn't understand. He would tell them things, they don't get it. He tried to get things in their head and in their hearts. They can't grasp it. Why? Because they needed the Holy Spirit. He said, the Holy Spirit will teach you all things. What? Didn't you teach us everything? He said, no. I just laid the foundation. But what takes the words and put it in your hearts and even make it action in you is the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit can never be given except for children. Holy Spirit is given for children. And I'm, I'm going to remind you with the very famous saying that, you know, Egyptian parents tell their kids, yeah, Ya Ruhi. Ya Ruhi means you are my spirit or I give you my spirit. When I love you, I give you everything. I give you even my spirit. I give you my spirit. What does that mean? When we become the children of God through salvation, then we receive the Spirit of God to be actually within us and to lead us. So it's better for the disciples to have the Holy Spirit within them than to have Jesus around them. He actually said that literally in John 16, 7. He said, nevertheless, I tell you the truth. Listen to this. Nevertheless, I tell you the truth. It is to your advantage that I go away. For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I depart, I will send him to you. Jesus has to go before the Father and offer the sacrifice of the cross that he gave. He goes into the holiest and anoint that with, with, with blood. And then the Father breathes the good aroma of the sacrifice, and he says, I'm comfortable now, and I can give them my Holy Spirit. Okay? So that's the context of the entire speech of Jesus, that I'm going away, but it's good for you, it's for your advantage. Now, let's go to the, the, the verse that we're talking about. The Father is greater than I. I'll tell you two explanations, okay, that the church says about this verse. One is less likely and one more likely. The less likely is the Father is greater than I because he's in a greater place. He's in a much better place. He's in his glory. I'm not in my glory right now. I'm on earth. I'm now a, 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 a slave. I'm in the form of man. I'm not in the glory as the Father is. Okay? That's good can understand it that way, but it doesn't go along with the context. In the context, Jesus is trying to tell them, it's good for you. I'm doing everything that's good for you. And to tell you the truth, Jesus never cares about what's good for him. 
He always cares about what's good for us. So what does it mean by saying the Father is greater than I? It's very simple. The Father is greater than the Son, not because He's better than the Son or higher than the Son, but because He's the Father. There is a role. There is Father, there is Son, there is Holy Spirit. When I say that, it's not theologically or, or theological wise, but etiquette wise. Etiquette wise, you put the fathers first, and then you put the son. I'll explain it actually in, 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 a, in, a, <clears throat> in a way where it was actually meant. You gotta understand that this the culture of the Bible is the culture of the Middle East 2,000 years ago, okay? In this culture, and I don't want to say, you know, a good culture or bad culture, but in that culture, there is a hierarchy, and the hierarchy is respected so much. The hierarchy is respected so much. In that culture, even till now, the father is respected much, much more the son. Even if the son is greater than the father. I could be a father, and my son grows to be the president of the United States. God forbid. <laughs> then he is greater than I. Okay? But... He will always be my son and even pays me more respect than he is, even though he is the president of the United States. Let me give you a story. Okay, ready? There was a patriarch, okay? A patriarch uh, uh, of... of one of the patriarchs in the Coptic church. He was ordained as a patriarch. And then after ordination, he went back home to his city. Okay? And when he went to his city, he discovered that his mother never came to greet him. So he was surprised. He didn't see her in the church. It should be like her son is a patriarch. He's coming to the church. You know, supposed to come and greet him. So he decided that out of respect, for his mother that he goes to visit her. So he went to visit her and he saw her like not excited about him or his coming and she just met him as his, you know, her little son. And then he said, like, mother, aren't you like proud of me and you're happy that I'm a patriarch and I'm here? And she said something unbelievable. She said, I wish I heard the news of your death rather than your ordination as a patriarch. Of course, the spiritual meaning behind that, that he's getting a huge responsibility. And she told him, you, have, you are responsible over your soul, but you're, now you're responsible over the souls of millions. So God be with you in your responsibility. It's more responsibility than advantage. Look at it this way. What I'm trying to tell you is the Father, the Son. Let me tell you another verse that Jesus said, Matthew 10, 24. He said, a disciple is not above his teacher, nor a servant above his master. Have you ever thought about this verse? Think about it. A disciple is not above his teacher. Come on. The disciple goes out of his teacher and he becomes a greater teacher, and he becomes a scientist, and he becomes something very, 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 very high. How come the disciple cannot be above his teacher? Have you ever thought about this? What's the explanation to this verse? I'll tell you another parable from the background, the Middle Eastern background, to tell you that even the kid that I taught, okay, when he goes out of school, 
And when he becomes the greatest scientist, and he, when he becomes the greatest person in the world, I'm still his teacher. And he pays me respect till he dies. Okay, I'll tell you a parable in Arabic that gives you an idea about what we're talking about. We have a parable in Arabic that says, and the reason why I'm telling you parables and stuff like that in, in Arabic, because I'm trying to give you the culture, the background, where this verse was said. There is a parable that says, "Man alamani harfan, sirta lahu abdan." Anyone who taught me one letter, I became his slave for good. Can you believe that? If someone taught me one letter, not just 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 a word, just one letter, I become a slave to this person. Now look at the verse that we're studying. The Father is greater than I. Not because the Father is different than I am, who I am. Not that we are different than each other, but because He's the Father and I'm the Son. Therefore, the Father is greater than I. I have no problem saying that. And that doesn't make anyone better than anyone, but because there is hierarchy. You know, also, Christ says that the, in, in the Bible, that the, the wife submits to the husband. And we have a hard time explaining that. Terrible time explaining that. How the wife can submit to her husband. Not because the husband is better by any means. Most of the time, you know, yeah, so. <laughs> not any better. Because there is hierarchy. You know, it says that in the Bible. St. Paul said it. The head of, of man, the head of the woman is the man, and the head of man is Christ, and the head of Christ is the Father, and so on. It's the respect to this hierarchy. So when you understand the Father is greater than I, it has nothing to do with the divinity of Christ. As a matter of fact, this came in the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John is the Gospel that is spoke most about the unity between the Father and the Son. And I'll tell you a couple of verses right now if you want to take note of them. I didn't have time to make you some notes or PowerPoint. John 5.23 says that all should honor the Son just as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Meaning, one honor for the Father and the Son, one God. Next, John 14, 1. You believe in God, believe also in me. Meaning, without believing in me, you can't believe in the Father, one essence. John 5, 17. My Father has been working until now, and I have been working one work for the Father and the Son. John 10, 30, I and my Father are one. This is the most important verse that you should remember. Anyone who tells you, how come in your gospel it says the Father is greater than I? Tell him John 10, 30. Remember this, John 10, 30. I and, the fa and my Father are one. Very clear, can't be clearer than this. John 17, 10, and all mine are yours and yours are mine. Okay? One being. One being. John 17, 3. And this eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Knowledge of the Father and the Son has an eternal life. Both of them. The Father is greater than I. Let's give me, let me give you the moral behind that. To tell you the truth, many times I ask myself, God, why did you put these difficult verses that make people stumble? And they make Muslims come and say, how come this is written in your gospel and, and they can't believe? Like, why? Give me, let me give you a verse here. Jesus answered and said to them in John 5, 19. That's the controversial verses. 
Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, listen, this is like a very difficult verse. The son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the father do. For whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. Why? It, it, it means the son cannot do anything by himself. The father has to tell him what to do. How is this? Like, why is this? I'll, I'll give you another one. John 6, 38. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Don't you have the same will? Why? Why these verses? Hmm. Well, I don't blame you if you don't know. I've been asking for years, and I got the answer recently. <laughs> huh. Close. Uh, close. I need a word, because that's how I prepared it, okay? Yes. Meditate on. Okay. Ah. It's a humility. It's a humility. A lot of times you read this and say, what is this? The son makes himself lower than the father even though he's equal with the father. Why is this? There's no other reason but he is emphasizing on the message of humility even if this will offend some people. As a matter of fact, the whole idea of incarnation is a big offense to people. How God became man. But remember, the sin that kicked Adam and Eve out of paradise was pride. Let's be like God. Let's be independent of God. So the Son of God came, the new Adam, to be exactly the opposite of the first Adam. To be completely humble and depend, depending, and, and, and dependent on the Father. Not that He is dependent, but very submissive and very humble to the Father. Such an amazing way. If you don't understand this concept, there is no way you can understand half of the Gospel of St. John. And you will always be like, why is these verses and I can't? Like, how come it says here and it says there? Let me, in this context, let me read these verses again. Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son of Man can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Humility and submission to the Father. So the spiritual lesson we're learning from this question, the Father is greater than I. Do you submit to the Father the same way? Do you humble yourself the same way? Is your life there to glorify God or to glorify yourself? Can you honestly and sincerely say that the Father is greater than I? Or as St. John the Baptist said it, he must increase, but I must decrease. It's the same message of Holy Week, that God is everything and I'm nothing. In a practical way, so many times we are tempted to take credit over things happening in the ministry or things happening in life in general. And I want to take pride in that. Even I want to take pride over the good things happening in my life, spiritual life. Do I give the credit to God 100%? Not even 99%? Do I give credit even to others that I may glorify God in this? 
Can I accept the humiliation and suffering for God's sake? Over my own comfort? That's the, that's the, the practical application of that the Father is greater than I. Just the humility in the gospel of, of St. John is just unbelievable. Okay? And if we understand any of these verses out of this context, we have no idea uh, uh, what we're talking about and what he is talking about. Last thing I want to say is the humility of God just way, 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 way up there. And there's no way I can get 1% or 1 over infinity from the humility of Christ because it's infinite. It's unbelievable. But what I say is whenever I unite with Christ in communion, in his words, anytime I get in his presence, I ask, God, please give me of what's yours. Give me of your humility. Let me experience that. I can do it on my own. I can never be humble like you. I can never be one over a million. Let me tell you, this is how we are brought back to God, through the divine humility of Christ. And that's the way for us to get back to God. That's the way that we return to God, that we become united with God. If God is so humble like this, how can I be united with God when I'm still struggling? When someone looks at me or don't answer me or humiliate me or, or tell me something, I get offended and I, and I, and I, and I get, and I get a angry and, and, and all of this. How, how can I be united with God? Read the Bible forward and backward and memorize the Bible and, and do everything. But if you can't learn this, then you're still far away. Learn from me, for I am humble and lowly of heart. And let me tell you, this is the hardest, the hardest thing you can ever learn. The hardest thing. Because it requires you to completely deny yourself and to defeat your ego, which is not an easy thing. It needs a daily struggle, daily struggle, daily prayer, and, 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 and making sure that this is a goal for me in, in my spiritual life. And the goal is not the humility. The goal is God is everything, and I am nothing. And when he's everything and I'm nothing, believe me, he will give us the glory back. He's going to tell me, then you are united with me, then you're everything. And you own, you own everything. And you, 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 you have the inheritance with me. And you sit me, with me on my throne and all of these great things that we heard this week. Glory be to God forever and ever.